Hi, I must say, and today I have Audio GD's Master 9 by very popular request. Now, before I get started, I'd just like to remind everyone that these videos are supported by patrons and people who have bought gear through the links in the descriptions of my videos. If you'd like to become a patron for the equivalent of buying me a coffee or, or a meal once in a while, you actually get to see all these videos in advance. You can ask me questions directly and participate in our little community of members. So anyway, anyway without further ado, Audio Genie's Master 9 is their flagship preamp and headphone amp. Now, well, maybe not quite the flagship because the flagship is a larger version of exactly the same preamp and headphone amp, but with a regenerative power supply built in, and that's called the HE9. Now, I already have a regenerative power supply behind my desk. It's a PS Audio Power Plant Premiere, so I've no need of such a, such a bulky thing using up uh, large amounts of power. So I just have the Master 9 here, and I chose it specifically because it was an absolutely neutral and, uh, well, aimed to be absolutely uncolored amp. Now you see it's considerably larger than some of the other amps I've looked at in the past. We've already seen uh, SoundAware's uh, P1 and we have you know other amps on here, so the IFI Pro ICANN and also we review which will come up soon the Pro IDSD. But being considerably larger you know what is what's going on here? Well basically the whole amp itself is mostly power supply. So compared to Audio GD's smaller amps what you're looking at is a uh, a device where as you get as the devices get larger the quality and uh, the sophistication of the power supplies steadily increase so whereas maybe you're in a small amp you might have one power supply and then it has you know no, it outputs to you know the different parts the amplification part the control part or whatever other parts of the amp are in there uh, in audio gd the power coming in has the three transformers in the back and those transformers split out power into power supply groups, which are little power supplies on their own. And each one of those power supplies provides a single voltage. And that's instead of having one large power supply with resistors going off, you know, controlling the voltage to multiple things. So something that's draining a lot of power, such as the amplification circuits, isn't affecting the other circuits or the other circuits aren't affecting it. So you can, you can, the, that power supply can just supply power to that part of the circuit that's necessary. And in the case of Audio GD gear, it's usually one single voltage per power supply. And with that, you know, the, that's why the performance is better than the smaller components. But looking at the whole design, it's actually quite a complex amp. If we start with the back, it has no less than five inputs. We have two single-ended inputs, and we have two balanced inputs. And uh, because the, uh, the Master 9 is a uh, separated into three whole large component or well, two whole large sections I should say you know the left hand channel and the right hand channel these inputs are on either side corresponding to those uh, circuit boards and then we also have a fifth input which is the ACSS input which I'll talk about a bit later if you've already seen one of my reviews such as the audio duties R2R7 DAC review you'll understand what that's about but we'll talk about that a little bit later that's a current mode input now, the input for this uh, amp is, is kind of rather different to what you usually get. Now, the, the amp itself uses a, a stepped attenuator, but it's relay-controlled stepped attenuator, so it's uh, boards inside, one for each channel, and they have a series of resistors on there corresponding to the volume level required and a series of relays that switch those in and out. And that also affects the gain as well because the gain, normally on a, an amp, the, uh, the input is, goes straight to the volume control. And from there it goes into the amplification circuits. That's a whole different setup with the Audio GD Master 9 because on the other end of the system we have the gain setting, which is normally you know, uh, a setting on the output, which you know, flicks in a set of you know, maybe resistors to lower the gain as necessary. But in this case, the whole setup with volume and gain is actually microprocessor controlled. And it's not on the input. Now what happens with the, uh, the input is that the... Uh, Inputs are all uh, converted from a voltage signal into a current signal, so it's a current gain amplification amp. And that signal is then you know, is amplified, and the output to the voltage output stage for you know, the preamp or the headphone amp, it goes passes through the volume control, which acts as the current to voltage converter. And so that microprocessor controlled uh, volume control also has two different mappings of which resistors are switched in, one for high gain and one for low gain. So it's kind of a rather rather different system from usual and there's a small uh, problem, potential problem with this is that if you have something with a very high output, norm, higher than the normal 2 volts for single ended or 4 volts for balanced, there's a possibility of overloading the input stage on one of these amps, say if you had say 
uh, something like I have a chord Hugo 2 here, and I can turn the volume up quite loud on that and the output quite high. And of course the consequence of that is I could overload the input stage, but you know, I know where roughly where 2 volts maximum is and, and not to do that. But it's a small potential problem. Another potential problem with the inputs is that when they're switched out, like if you switch on input 1, inputs 2 through to 5 are shorted. And that means they, it prevents a, a problem that can occur where if you have music playing from two different inputs, if you uh, turn, off, turn off one and then switch to another, you can very faintly hear the, other, the uh, signal from the other input. By shorting them, that cuts out that signal. Now, that can be a problem if you're someone like me who has a shit audio Yggdrasil sitting here, and I'm outputting that to, say, the uh, Master 9. I'm outputting it to a bunch of other amps as I'm testing or listening with. So if you short the output of a shit audio Yggdrasil, say the, the uh, balanced outputs, then it affects the signal on the single-ended outputs as well. It really reduces the signal and causes a bit of a problem. So you may not want that. That's if you, if you open up, take the top off, there's actually little jumpers in there you can pull off and remove the signal shorting option. So already we haven't really got past the input and we're already getting quite, quite, it's getting quite complex. On the output you have your normal uh, single-ended and balanced outputs. Now the whole amp is balanced or differential in its design and it's ideally meant to be used with the balanced output. So the single-ended output will only use half the circuit. Now on the input, the uh, if you input a single-ended signal, it will be sp split into a, uh, a balanced signal, so it will be amplified in the balanced mode. So that's not quite so critical. One problem that you do have with that is that you don't get as strong a signal. So you do have to turn the volume up if you're using the uh, single-ended input uh, so that you can get you know equivalent volume to the balanced input. So you don't have quite as much volume range there. Although usually, unless you're listening to something with something like Susvaras or the or Hi Man's HG6, then it's usually not uh, much of a problem. But in those cases, you can actually order a special version of the amp with even higher output for things like the HG6 and Susvaras. So with that output, you on the front as well as well as your power button, you have the uh, headphone or preamp mode. It can just be switched in or out as necessary. Your gain settings, low or high and you can select your input as usual, one, two, three, four, or five. And there you just have the volume control, and you can hear the clicking in there as it switches through the relays. And handily, like a proper hi-fi stereo component, it comes with a big aluminium remote control. And from that you can just select you know, the channel, there are other settings that can be programmed with it, and of course the volume control, you can go up and down the stages, although it doesn't move very fast. Now an interesting thing about the inputs for this is that when you switch channel, there's a three second delay before the channel is actually engaged. Now I found that really annoying, so something you can do is Kingwork can custom program them, and I had it custom programmed so that when an input is switched, it auto immediately switches it in. So do note that if you do want something like that, all it is is a chip, and the only if you do need to change chips, all you really need to do is pull out a few uh, screws, pull the front panel out, and gently coax out a uh, program chip, and then put a new one in. So I actually did that. It didn't take me much effort at all. But one thing about having such a large amp, and same with the Studio 6 here, is that after a while of using them, they get warm. So after a few hours of being on, or at least an hour, they start to warm up. And that can affect the sound quality. Now, there have been measurements posted online of what happens if uh, the effect that uh, happens with resistors after they have, and when, the temp when they're cold, and then after they've been put in through an amp and they've warmed up. And it can be significant enough to make an audible difference. So it's not... Uh, a no one is kidding at all when they say that these uh, amps sound best after they've been on at least an hour. Though depending who you talk to, you know, I tend to find it best if I leave, turn it on in the morning and come back in the afternoon and it sounds even better than it did before. That's been my experience. Now, so I don't want to put a figure on it, but you know, I tend to feel they sound best after four hours. So that's the only kind of penalty with these is that they still sound good. It still sounds like a good amp when you switch it on from cold, but it tended to sound best, you know, after a few hours of warm-up. The other question that comes up is burn-in. Now, depending who you talk to, the Audio GD gear needs a lot of uh, burn-in, a lot of time being used before it sounds its best. So usually I just leave them on for a couple of weeks, which usually goes through the, the normal 250 hours. Now, the Master Series gear, I believe, is tested for 100 hours at the factory to ensure, and then measured and, and listened to afterwards to make sure nothing goes wrong. So along with that, you know, just generally leaving it on a couple of weeks should... Uh, allow any changes that do happen in the components to occur and, and my experience with that is it caused more so by heat than anything uh, allows the components to settle in. Though I didn't notice with this any significant changes I have been switching around gear a lot so it's kind of hard to tell if anything uh, you know really significant happened. Probably. Now one of the features I talked about in my uh, R2R7 review was the ACSS connection.
Now, it's a current mode connection. This was made popular by brands such as Krell, uh, more recently in the headphone world by companies such as Bakun, who have their own uh, impl implementation of it. There are other manufacturers that do it as well. And by the idea is that by changing the sign signal to a current mode signal instead of a voltage signal, is that it should ideally reduce any potential distortion caused by, say, cables and components and what have you. Now, the other thing with audio GD gear is because it's amplified, the main amplification is done in current mode, what they do is, now if you have an audio GD, uh, some, an audio GD DAC, what will happen is the, out, the it will be the initial uh, DAC output will be amplified in current mode and then changed to voltage mode for output. And then of course, in once you plug it into a master nine or something like that, then the voltage is converted into current and that goes is amplified in current mode again. Now, what you want to do is you want to bypass that DAC's uh, current to voltage conversion and the amp's uh, voltage to current conversion. That's what the ACSS connection does. So it goes directly from the current amplification circuit of the DAC, say an R2R7, into the current amplification section of the, say, a Master 9. That should mean lower distortion. The only disadvantage, as we found with the R2R7, is if you're using the current mode output of one of their DACs. It, is, it makes the uh, use of the single-ended and balanced outputs kind of impossible because you are uh, affecting part of the circuit that's prior to the voltage output stage. But all the same, it means you can connect a bunch of components and you should be able to use, you know, like a preamp sitting nearby and a power amp sent further out in the room. And you should be able to uh, ne negate, for the most part, the need of, very, of uh, fancy cables. So what does all this end up adding to? So the problem I had when I first got one of Audio GD's balanced amps, actually the very first one, the Phoenix, was that King will ask me, well, what do you think? And I had no comment whatsoever. I was too busy listening to music. And the thing about the Master 9 is it's the same as much the same kind of experience. There is no particular sound that comes from the amp other than the music itself. If anything, you get really engaged in the actual music and you can, you can enjoy listening. And that can be good and bad in various different ways because if anything in your upstream components isn't perfect, it'll very clearly highlight it. Now, if you compare it to something like the recently reviewed Lear 3, that's a slightly colored amp. And that kind of makes up with the fact that, you know, maybe the uh, upstream components aren't really uh, absolutely perfect. It worked well with a, you know, a kind of lesser DAC, you know, like the uh, Modi Multi bit. It wasn't a problem. It added kind of a little bit of fun to the sound, and you know that you know that made it entertaining to listen with, even if it wasn't the most detailed amp. Now the Master Nine, on the other hand, is a very detailed amp. Probably the only thing that exceeds it in detail is if I plug my headphones directly into a Hugo Two. Plugging them in, let's say, with the Master 9 in the chain, I maybe lose a very slight bit of detail, a very slight bit of euphoria you can you can get with the, the Hugo 2 and my Focal Utopias, for example. Now, with something like something like uh, Hi-Fi Man Susvaras, now that kind, they, these tend to like, you know, a, a big, very slightly more kind of exciting sounding amp, maybe a big tube amp, for example. It doesn't have to be very colored, but something a little bit more dynamic. They tend to sound maybe a little bit kind of unexciting out of the Master 9, although they're driven quite adequately. And that can be one of the, the issues with this. With the Master 9, because it is a very detailed amp, it doesn't matter so much, but that kind of dead neutral tuning can be something of a bit of a trouble with the, with lesser amps where it can sound a little bit boring. So in that case, I can very much understand why some people prefer a slightly colored sound, whether it be in a solid state amp or a tube amp. You know, to a degree, you know, I usually plug my Hugo 2 into the uh, Studio 6 and it's got a very slight bloom in the bass. Now that very slight bloom kind of adds just that touch of niceness to the sound sometimes. Although again, I again, versus the Hugo 2, I lose a tiny bit of detail. So, but where's the Master 9, you know, with the original Yggdrasil Analog 1, the very original one, it had a slightly dry sound to it, you know, in comparison. This is, of course, in comparison with other DACs. People wouldn't necessarily say that directly about the uh, Yggdrasil, but, you know, comparisons are evil things. As soon as you start comparing stuff, you start noticing things which could, may possibly be better about components, and that's very much the case with the original Yggdrasil. And then comparing, you know, it tended to sound a little bit dry. And that with a very neutral amp, you know, I could really make that out. And it wasn't quite such the musical combination that I really liked. With the Analog 2, something I'll talk about in the review of it, uh, it has a little bit of cross talk which caught inside the bass, which causes a little tiny bit of uh, the equivalent of a bass hump in the mid bass, which makes things sound tiny bit warmer, as well as fixing some other issues that it had with uh, the playback. That makes it a better combination with a, with a Master 9, and it's kind of a very neutral presentation. One of the advantages of this kind of system is that the, the kind of background is absolutely black in terms of, you know, there's absolutely silence from the amp when, the, you know, nothing's playing. 
And that has two advantages. You know, if you, I once remember I was, I was on a random playlist which had everything going from classical to pop. And I think I had the volume turned up for classical. And I mean, I think it was with the Phoenix, I remember, the, um, suddenly it jumped into uh, playing pop music. And, you know, the, it was like the band had just fallen out of the sky into my room. Uh, you know, a really, really big shock there because it can really bring out the dynamics just as they are. And then the other interesting thing about that is that if you plug IEMs into the Master 9 or any of the other, maybe even the mid-range Audio GD amp, the uh, NFB1 amp, the the absolute black background works very very well with IEMs and the the IEM drive of them even with the tiny balanced armatures is absolutely perfect it is absolutely precise and it's the the that really black background works really really well with IEMs so if anything you know this this you know massively overkill you know amp with IEMs but still it's the very low distortion design means that they they sound really fantastic out of it even if most of the time I'm only plugging them in through the single-ended socket. Compared to other amps, you know, this is again the thing which came up with the Lear 3. You lose some, you know, detail versus a higher-end amp, but you get a little bit of kind of more fun and entertainment. The same kind of thing with, say, uh, SoundAware's P1. It has a very slightly sweet sound, which again, sometimes I prefer, such as with the Yggdrasil, you know, that, that slightly drier sound with this slightly sweeter sound P1 was a nicer combination in a way. Whereas, you know, this can sound, you know, a little bit too neutral, a little bit too plain. Um, but again, this has the more detail. If I really, really focus in and listen carefully with a high quality recording, this extracts just a tad more detail than the P1, especially when consider that it's very power supply dependent. You know, even with them plugged into my power regenerator, it's still the Master 9 beats it in, in technical performance. Similarly to IFI's Pro ICANN, it's a, you know it's a very great amp if you want to if you put on turn up the bass you can get 3D mode I uh, use the tube uh, features things like that that's where it works really really well in terms of detail retrieval well as I said in my review of that you know I plugged in an XDSD and a Hugo 2 and I couldn't tell the difference apart in detail through the Pro I can it's kind of sacrifices kind of like the Lear 3 it sacrifices uh, detail in terms of for more entertaining and punchy sound whereas this is kind of like the neutral get out of the way, don't impose anything whatsoever on the music kind of presentation. Similar to the uh, Audio Valve uh, Solaris, you know, that was a really kind of magnificent, powerful amp. And it, I like the presentation with it and the uh, Sasvaras, you know, like these big tube amps or big tube hybrid amps do a really good job. Maybe it, again, sacrifices just a tiny bit of detail, you know, for its kind of more complex circuit versus the Master 9 where it, it aims to the actual circuitry that processes the audio is as minimal as possible. Compared to Audio GD's own NFB1 amp and the, the R28 DAC amp, which both of which I reviewed earlier, the uh, just as I said in my R28 review, the, the, the presentation is, is much the same. It's kind of neutral, nothing but the facts kind of presentation. But especially with acoustic music, you notice a greater sense of space and depth to the music. You know, you can hear instruments are, are better separated out. Uh, you know, there's a wider sense of sound stage. Generally, the overall presentation is better than with uh, the mid-range amps. Of course, this assumes, and when I was, you know, when I was listening, I was at least using uh, the r 28 built-in DAC, or I was using a Shit Audio Yggdrasil or Hugo 2 or R2R7. So, if you, it does require that you have a high-end DAC that matches the uh, Master 9 to get the, kind of get the most out of it. Now, my only regrets in ordering this is I wish I'd asked for three four-pin XLR sockets because the dual three-pin uh, socket option is very redundant. Unfortunately, there are no Pentacon sockets available currently in this format, though I hope that will change in the near future. But otherwise, you know, it's been, a, you know, if I want an amp that I know it's extremely consistent in its performance, it's extremely detailed, I can get a very good idea of what components sound like. This has been really fantastic in that way. For those of you interested in tweaks, the thing about uh, having a very large and comprehensive power supply is it seems to be less influenced by things like power cords and, and power reconditioners. So, for example, little, uh, the uh, P1 was more influenced by whether I plugged it directly in, into a uh, power point or whether I plugged it through the power regenerator was more noticeable. The Master 9 is less noticeable in that regard. I mean, you probably, depending how your environment is, maybe I've had a few people say, you know, that power cord makes the difference. And generally what power cord, higher quality power cords are for is to reject outside noise. And if they're long enough, we'll actually knock out some high frequency noise in the signal. So at least 1.5 meters, I'm told, will actually reduce some of the high frequencies passing through 
which is why supposedly power cords work. But the, the idea of buying something like this is that it will work great even with a stock power cord. And that Audio GD doesn't use any fancy power cords when they test their stuff. They use the same stock power cords they use which they ship out to people. So that's the Master 9. Uh, it's been it, it's the amp that's always going to be sitting here because it always gives a consistent performance. So I do hope you like my overview of that amp. If you do have any questions or comments, don't feel free to add them below the video. Uh, don't forget to read it in the description in case I missed anything. Or also, if you'd like to support, support me, please do consider buying stuff through the links in the description. And thanks once again to my patrons for supporting my videos. Some of the gear that you can't actually see, which is in the background, is the result of people supporting me, either through buying stuff through uh, on Amazon, where I've used to buy equipment to improve these videos, or my patrons. For the equivalent of supporting me, if you like buying me a coffee once in a while, you get to see these videos in advance, and they will have already seen these videos. They can interact with me online, ask me questions, get feedback, get help with gear, get my advice, and all that kind of thing, and participate in a, in a really great little community we've built. So please do consider joining up. And thanks once again, and I'll see you online.